Hello everyone. On today's webinar, which is the last one Thorlabs is broadcasting this year. My name is Axel Stürmer and I'm the marketing manager of Thorlabs Germany. I will guide you through this webinar as moderator. In the fourth and final installment of our light characterization series of webinars, Manfred Gonnert will talk about light polarization. He will cover different approaches to its definition, how to measure various key parameters of polarization and which applications make use of polarized light. Manfred has been working at Thor Labs for 30 years. He is head of the Thor Labs light detection and analysis team and, is, and thus is responsible for and supervises the development of our power meter and sensor, beam profiler and polarimeter product lines. Manfred's presentation will take approximately 45 minutes with a subsequent Q&A session. To submit a question, simply click on the Q&A tool in the top right corner of your screen. Feel free to ask questions even during the presentation. We will collect all questions and discuss them once Manfred has finished. I hope you will enjoy today's webinar and I turn it over to Manfred. Axel, many thanks for your introduction. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our audience to this webinar on characterizing beam polarization. So we, will, we start with the electromagnetic behavior of light, explain the basics of polarization and how it can be represented mathematically and graphically. We move on to why polarization is of interest and how it can be measured. In the last part, we will talk about some things to consider in order to make reliable measurements. Within the light detection and analysis webinar series, we talked about laser power measurement, pulse detection and beam shape and waste measurement. Uh, these recorded webinars can be found on the Thorlips webpage. Today, we will talk about polarization, how it can be calculated, visualized and measured. Okay, let's start with some basics about light. Light is known as an electromagnetic radiation that ranges from gamma rays to radio waves. For today's uh, webinar, we will focus on the 350 nanometer to 2.5 micron range in which the polarization measurement and analysis is possible with a reasonable effort. Light can be seen as an electromagnetic wave that oscillates perpendicular to the direction of propagation. The electromagnetic field vectors can be expressed by their X and Y components. And since the electric field and the magnetic field perpendicular to it propagate uniformly, it is sufficient to only consider the vectors of the electric field in order to determine the polarization of light. Thus, polarization is described by the electric wave orientation of the oscillation over time and space. When we look at the formula that describes the electric field vector, we can detect the dependency of the angular frequency omega and the wave number magnitude k. The difference of both, the so-called propagator, describes the temporal beam propagation in space. The time-space propagator is the same for the X and Y components of the electric field and can therefore be excluded from the calculation of the field vector. Natural light is usually unpolarized. There are randomly changing polarization state and phase difference. The most obvious natural light source is sunlight um, other unpolarized light is emitted from ordinary, ordinary light bulbs. Nevertheless, also this light can get polarized to a certain extent, for example, when it gets reflected. Polarized light is given at a stable oriented oscillation of electromagnetic waves. The X and Y components of the electric field have a fixed phase difference. Laser light is typically fully polarized. Um, many light sources like LED or SLED emit only partially polarized light. When you have a closer look to polarized light, 
we can distinguish between some basic states of polarization. The fundamental polarization state is the elliptical polarization. There is a phase difference between the X and the Y oriented electric field, which however must be a, not be a multiple of P divided by two. The amplitudes of the X and Y field can be the same or different. And when looking into the beam's observation pane, plane, the field vectors states over time result in an ellipse. The first special case arises when the X and Y components don't show a phase difference. The resulting vector has an oscillation along a constantly tilted plane. In the observation plane, the electric, electric field vector describes a line. When X and Y oscillation have the same magnitude, we speak from a linear 45 degree of polarization. The second special is given at a phase difference of 90 degrees. When X and Y fields have the same amplitude, the field vector describes a circle. In that case, we talk about circular polarization. To sum up, there are three different basic types of polarization. The general elliptical, um, and the special linear at no phase difference and the circular at 90 degree phase shift between X and Y electric field components. Now we will look how the state of polarization can be described in vector models. To break down the formula for the electric field over time, two methods have been established. The first is the Jones calculus that is only applicable to light that has already that is already fully polarized. The Jones calculus is a time-dependent representation of the complex electric field vectors. The two-dimensional Jones vector is a vector in complex space. Delta expresses the phase difference between X and Y component of the field vector. Light, which is randomly polarized, partially polarized or incoherent, must be treated using the Stokes parameters. The Stokes parameters are an intensity dependent description of certain states of polarization. The first entry, the S0, describes the total intensity. S1, S2, and S3 describe the state of polarization in a three-dimensional space. In short, S1 is the proportion of horizontal to vertical linear polarization, S2 the proportion on the linear plus minus 40 degree, 45 degree, and S3 the portion of right and left circular polarization. Stokes parameters don't give information about the phase difference. Here is an overview over the especially important, the so-called degenerate polarization states at the borderline points where the parameters become zero or one. Starting with the linear horizontal polarization, the field vector oscillates only in the X direction. The opposite is the vertical linear uh, polarization. Um, when both vectors have the same amplitude and no phase difference, we come to the linear plus 45 degree polarization and the linear minus minus 5 degree polarization for 180 degree phase difference. The other two extrema are the right circular polarization with same amplitude of X and Y and 90 degree phase shift. Opposite here is the left circular polarization at minus 90 degree phase difference. 
These special states are the base to be able to measure polarization. Last state that can only be described in Stokes vector representation is unpolarized light. So we already learned that there is a left and a right. And to be able to talk about the same left and right, it is important to agree on a common so-called handedness. So there are two standards. First is the IEEE standard that looks from the source point of view in our example, the orange circle would then be left-hand circular. The second is the Jones calculus that looks from the receiver or detector point of view into the beam. Our example here is then seen as right-hand circular. Forlabs has adopted the Jones calculus of point of view in its software documentation and technical resources. In the next chapter, we will see how to get from one state of polarization to another. The state of polarization remains stable as long the light doesn't get reflected or passed through any polarizing medium. There are many optical elements that may change the state of polarization in either a desired or an undesired way. In our example, we are showing the transformation of the polarization from a linear to a circular state by keeping a constant power level. To achieve this, a wave plate made of biofringent material can be used. Such quarter wave plate delays of the field vectors that are parallel to its slow axis by lambda divided by 4 that corresponds to pi divided by 2 or 90 degrees, while the fast axis has no delay. Here we can observe the experiment from previous page in a video demonstration. The initial state is linear and after aligning the retarder, the polarization turns to circular. Any polarizing element can be described by a transformation matrix. For the four element Stokes vector, a four by four real element Müller matrix is used to describe a polarizing element. In Jones calculus, there is a complex two by two Jones matrix equivalent. For calculating the output polarization vector, the input vector and the matrix must be multiplied. Here again, our example with the quarter wave plate. The first calculation shows the Stokes vector for a linear plus 45 degree polarization the Müller matrix for the retarder and the Stokes vector for the transformed output state of polarization. In this case, right circular. Second calculation gives the same result using the Jones matrix and vectors. In the last slides, we saw the transformation from one state of polarization to another SOP using polarizing optical elements. Here again, an example from a linear plus 45 degree to linear horizontal. Polarizers have a transmission axis. The field vectors that are not aligned with this axis get absorbed. It is also possible to turn unpolarized light to polarized light, again using a linear polarizer. The other way around is to depolarize polarized light by using an integrating sphere. Due to multiple reflections inside the sphere, time and space information of the electric field gets lost, resulting in unpolarized light at the output port. 
laser beams are usually neither fully polarized nor completely unpolarized. The degree of polarization is introduced in order to quantify the amount of the polarized light components. The degree of polarization is the ratio between the polarized light component and the total power. The degree of polarization can range from zero for unpolarized light to 100% for completely polarized light. And the degree of polarization can only be calculated with the Stokes parameters, but not with the uh, Jones vector. So there is a further distinction in degree of polarization, the degree of linear polarization. Here is the ratio between the linearly polarized light component to the total power. This value is important in applications for PM fiber coupling or liquid crystal displays. There is also the term degree of circular polarization, um, which is the ratio of circularly polarized light to the total power. The necessity for perfectly circular polarized light can be found in applications for material processing, astronomy, photography, or biological imaging. There is also a graphical visualization of polarization. A simple way of displaying the polarization graphically is to investigate the observation plane and plot the field vector over time. Hereby, the x and y field vectors span the coordinate system. The ellipse has its own coordinate system that is rotated by the azimut angle psi. The angle between the major ellipse axis and the x-axis of the field vector coordinate system is also called orientation angle. A second angle, the ellipticity angle, chi, is a measure for the ellipse opening. In addition, it is important to indicate the rotation direction. Um, azimut and ellipticity can also be calculated from the field vector and the phase difference. Our example here shows a right-hand circular polarization. The next example shows one of the polarization states where the ellipse degenerates to a circle. In that borderline case, the field components have the same magnitude, but they are shifted by 90 degrees in phase. A circular polarization is given when the orientation angle is zero. That means the ellipse is aligned with the XY coordinate system. Further, the ellipticity at its, is at its maximum, resulting in a chi angle of 45 degrees. Here we are having a right-hand circular polarization. Also in this example, the field vectors have the same magnitude, but the phase difference is zero. The azimut angle is 45 degrees and the ellipse is completely closed. That means the ellipticity angle is zero. We see here a plus 45 degree linear polarization. That is also one of the degenerate or borderline case polarization states. Finally, we come to the case where one field vector has zero amplitude. In that case, there is 
no rotation and no ellipse opening. So both psi and chi angles are zero. There are existing two of such states. So here shown horizontal polarization and in opposite direction, the vertical polarization. The second way to graphically represent states of polarization is the Poincaré sphere. To visualize the state of polarization, the Stokes vector must be normalized, meaning S0 is normalized to 1 by dividing all other parameters by 0, S0. Um, S1, S2, and S3 span a Cartesian coordinate system, and the radius of the sphere is 1, so every point on its sphere surface means a degree of polarization of 100%. Points inside the sphere, starting in the center with unpolarized light, are partially polarized meaning a degree of polarization between 0 and 100%. The equator plane is the area for linear states of polarization with the four degenerate states at the external points of the main axis. These are horizontal linear, um, vertical linear, further linear plus and linear minus 45 degree. The northern hemisphere accommodates the right-hand elliptical states of polarization with its right circular state at the North Pole, and the left-hand elliptical states are in the southern hemisphere with the left circular state at the South Pole. I will demonstrate an example for a right-hand elliptical polarization state with 100% degree of polarization. The azimuth angle can be measured between the S1 axis and the vector protect projection to the equator. And the ellipticity is, um, is measured between the equator plane and the vector orientation. Note in this Poincaré sphere representation, the angles in the sphere are twice the psi and chi angles. Um, psi and chi can also be calculated from the Stokes parameters. To summarize, both Jones and Stokes are vector representation of the states of polarization. Both modes of representation use a transformation matrix to get from one state to another. Both use the orientation and elasticity angles to describe the state of polarization. Um, the Stone's calculus does not give the phase information of the electric field vector and Jones is limited to a normal angle of incidence and works only for fully polarized light. The Jones calculation is based on complex numbers, while the Stone calculation is based on real numbers. Now we know how polarization can be described mathematically and represented graphically, um, but why is it important to know about polarization and the different polarization states? Most of us already have encountered polarization in our daily life. Think of polarized sunglasses that suppress reflections from reflective surfaces. This method is used in many applications, for example, in photography or microscopy to enhance the image quality. 
Hereby, reflections get reduced and contrast improved to emphasize structures and features. This applies also to material characterization like the ellipsometry, polarization sensitive OCT, check for mechanical stresses or simply the optical behavior of polarization dependent transmission and reflectivity of optical elements. A very important application is the area around liquid crystal displays using polarizing filters and by rotating the polarization, the pixels on the displays can turn dark or light. Further, there are entertainment applications that for example are using polarization in 3D cinema. In telecom fiber networks, polarization dependent loss and polarization mode dispersion it must be taken care to optimizing the transfer security and transfer speed. For quantum cryptography, the key distribution and decryption is performed by separating the polarization states. Other applications can be found in stabilization of laser power and quantum computing. In LiDAR, polarization is used to overcome sensing issues in degraded visibility conditions like fog. In the next chapter, we finally will demonstrate how to measure the Stokes parameters. A straightforward method that can also be performed manually is to measure the overall power at certain predefined polarization states. To generate these requires the use of two optical elements. A polarizer that passes light only in the direction of its transmission axis and a quarter wave plate that is able to perform a phase shift between the electric field vectors. We want to measure a random elliptically polarized light with unknown amplitude and phase shift. In a first power measurement, the polarizer is aligned that it only transmits the horizontal light components. For the second power record, the polarizer gets rotated by 90 degrees so light along the Y field vector is generated. From these first measurements, the Stokes parameter S0 and S1 can be calculated by simply adding or subtracting the results. For the next measurement, we are turning the polarizer in a plus 45 degree position and get the power for the linear plus 45 degree state. With that measurement result, it is possible to calculate the S2 parameter of the Stokes vector. Now there is still missing the elliptical component of the incoming beam. To get this, we are rotating the incoming optical field by 90 degrees with the horizontally aligned quarter wave plate. This means that we are applying an additional 90 degree phase shift to the X and Y electric field vectors. We then let pass um, this light through the still 45 degree aligned linear polarizer and measure the optical power again. With that, we are getting the third Stokes parameter that is the measure for the ellipticity. The manual measurement of the state of polarization is very time and space consuming. The input polarization may not change during the whole procedure. And in addition, all components must be aligned in a very accurate way. To overcome this, we are looking on two ways to automate the measurement of systems parameters. The first one is the four detector method that works similar to what we did with the manual method. Hereby, the incoming beam gets split into four even parts. 
with applying the four different polarization states afterwards. The picture demonstrates how this could look in a fiber-based manner. And the second method is the rotating quarter wave plate polarimeter. With that technique, the incoming light gets phase modulated by the rotating wave plate and intensity modulated with a fixed polarizer. This is the method that is used by Thorlabs in the PAX 1000 polarimeter series. Let me demonstrate the two methods in detail. Starting with the four detector method, one possible setup can be using three non-polarizing beam splitters with a 50 by 50 splitting ratio. We are arranging them in a manner to getting four even power levels from the incoming beam. On one end plate, plane, a quarter wave plate is mounted. Further, we need to place four polarizers to generate the states described in the manual method. Linear horizontal, linear vertical, and two linear plus 45 degree polarizations. Finally, we place four photodiodes with similar spectral receptivity. Now to the procedure. The incoming laser light gets split and measured by the four photodiodes at the same time. From these measurements, all four Stokes parameters can be calculated. While this method is very fast, it has some drawbacks. There is a strong wavelength dependence given by the number of lined up components. The alignment of these components must be very accurate. Further, it is crucial that the incoming beam is aligned in a perfect way. Um, this method is mainly used for fiber-based measurements with a well-defined coupling. Now to the rotating quarter wave plate technique. We are having a motor-driven true zero-order quarter wave plate that rotates around its radial axis. Behind that, a fixed polarizer with a high extinction ratio is positioned, followed by a large area low noise photo detector. The incoming, ideally collimated laser beam passes the rotating wave plate. During that, the electric field components get phase shifted between 0 and 90 degrees. That means a phase modulation is applied. The fixed positioned polarizer adds an amplitude modulation. Finally, the photodiode and downstream amplifier and analog to digital converter measures and records the power over time. After that, a fairly demanding algorithm that is based on the Jones matrices of the turning wave plate and fixed polarizer system included in this system Jones matrix are also the rotation information of the wave plate and the alignment of the polarizer. Um, the electric field that hits the photo detector can then be expressed as output Jones vector that is built by multiplication of the system matrix and the Jones vector of the signal to measure. The relation of the intensity over time is represented by multiplication of the complex Jones vector with its conjugate transposed vector. After a further breakdown, the intensity over time can be expressed as Fourier series. And back to the polarimeter measurement procedure, the sampled photodiode signal is subjected to a fast Fourier transformation. From the Fourier coefficients, it is possible to calculate the Stokes parameters and from that azimuth ellipticity, degree of polarization, 
and total power. Here a video demonstration how to connect the polarimeter in the PAX software. First is the polarization ellipse representation and in addition the Poincaré sphere. Here a trace function can be set to monitor how the state of polarization changes over time. And finally, a scope mode that plots the Stokes parameters, the both um, azimuth and ellipticity angles, degree of polarization, and power over time. Finally, a few tips on using our polarimeter and handling of polarization dependent components. In order to be able to take precise measurements, a few things must be observed. Most critical is the alignment of the incoming beam, since the retardation of the quarter wave blade slightly changes with the angle of incidence. Best results are here given at a normal incidence. So divergence and beam diameter are less critical. Uh, rule of thumb, the beam should be collimated and have a beam diameter of approximately one millimeter or lower and also that the divergency angle shouldn't be too large. To give a help on how to align the beam to the polarimeter, features the polarimeter software, a tool that checks the beam alignment for best performance. I will demonstrate this in the following small video demonstration. First, we are opening this alignment assess assistance tool. There are adjustable thresholds for a pass fail analysis. And you can see that the initial alignment is in the red fail area. And after tweaking the incoming beam, you can tweak as long as you get a sufficient alignment level. Now you can be sure that your incoming beam is properly aligned to the measurement device. And yeah, you can perform precise measurements. And there is an alternative testing procedure to check the proper alignment. And hereby you can place a rotatable linear polarizer in front of the polarimeter. And for a sufficiently aligned laser beam, the degree of polarization should not change more than plus minus 1% while turning this polarizer by 180 degrees. In the right animation, you can still see the polar uh, polarizer rotating. You are rotating this linear polaris, polarized light and see that the degree of polarization stays within the borders of plus minus 1%. As next point, 
I would like to point out that polarization dependent optics are very sensitive to mechanical stresses. Especially polarizers are dramatically dropping the extinction ratio. Therefore, all mounting must be done with low force. The use of O-rings um, can help and also um, the use of torque drivers should be considered. When gluing such components, look for adhesives uh, with a low shrinkage and hardness. And use mounting brackets that are designed to minimize stress on the optical components. Some words to polarization in fibers. Standard single mode fibers do not preserve the state of polarization. However, you can use such a fiber to transform the polarization by twisting and rotating um, to another state of polarization. Thorlabs here offers manual fiber polarization controllers, also known as Mickey ears. And when wanting to preserve the polarization, polarization maintaining fibers can be used. These panda or bow tie fibers consist of a pair of stress elements along the slow axis in the fiber cladding. Further, an elliptical fiber core. A linear polarization is maintained when the incoupled light is oriented accordingly, accordingly to one of the fiber axes. Yeah, we are slowly coming to the end of this presentation. Hence, an overview of the multitude of optical components, fibers, and fiber accessories that Thorlabs offers for polarization applications. In addition, there is various instrumentation like the polarimeters, extinction ratio meters, biofringence imaging, and polarization cameras in order to measure, characterize, and control the behavior of polarization. Finally, I want to point to the technical resources section on the ThoughtLabs website. Here you can find insights, articles, and videos, and all the recorded webinars around polarization and all the other interesting topics. Check also out for our tutorials, app notes, white papers, lab facts, and programming guides. So, I want to thank you for watching and listening. And to open the Q&A session, I'm giving back to Axel. Thank you, Manfred, for this uh, great presentation. Um, indeed, we have collected some questions throughout your talk, and um, I can go through them now. The first question I was asked is, uh, how is the standard uh, helium neon laser polarized? Because you mentioned, I assume this was um, due to the fact that you mentioned that lasers are polarized in general. Yeah, so a standard helium neon laser is typically linear, linear polarized with a degree of polarization of 100%. Okay, thank you. Just uh, just for your, um, for your notice, if you want to ask additional questions, just continue to post them in the Q&A session and we'll try to um, discuss them here if, if time allows. Next question was, does the DOLP, the degree of linear polarization, um, differ between horizontal, vertical, or plus 45 or minus 45 degree linear polarization? 
No, it doesn't. This uh, thing which between it's plain linear. So not depending how linear. OK, not the orientation. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Next question is about the PAX 1000 polarimeter. And whether the achromatic or the, the wave plate that is built into it is achromatic or whether it is important to set the wavelength um, to the correct value to get correct readings. Yeah, okay, this um, wave plate, it's not an achromatic wave plate um, and it is also um, um, applied with an AR coating. So we have only a limited wavelength range that is possible with one type of wave plate. And this is also why we offer several um, PAX 1000 polarimeters for different wavelength ranges. So, um, but this is corrected for, right? Um, the wave plate that is used um, is, the, 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 um, let's let's say it like that, the, the PAX uh, 1000 VIS, for instance, is, uh, yeah. is specified from 400 to 700 nanometers, mm -hmm. and you could still rely on measurements, of course, across yeah, this wavelength yeah. range. Absolutely. So the calibration or adjustment of these polarimeters is always done um, on at several wavelength points so that we cover really the whole operating wavelength range. OK. Another question about the PAX 1000 polarimeter series is how do they detect align alignment? You mentioned that there's alignment an alignment uh, tool and um, that you should uh, opt for uh, like almost 100% alignment for best results. How does it how does it detect this? And what would be the impact of bad alignment like 95% versus 98%? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so Mainly this alignment tool checks for the degree of polarization. Um, there are situations where this degree of polarization can go beyond 100% due to reflections or other un unwanted um, effects. And yeah, these are not real measurements. These are failures um, applied to misalignment. So we can check from the variance of the degree of polarization how well the alignment is. OK. Thank you. There have been a couple of more questions. I could see that um, some of which were maybe too specific to be answered um, in, the, in, the, in the general discussion. So please forgive us if we don't discuss them right now. We will follow up with all questions. If you leave us an email address or any other means to contact you, uh, just in case your question has not been asked uh, at this point. Um, maybe maybe uh, one more question, Manfred, because there's a couple of them um, around this. How to calibrate uh, the polarimeter? Do customers need to calibrate them like every once in a while, or do they have to um, return them to us for calibration? Yeah, if they, um, it, it should be calibrated from time to time, definitely. Um, and the alignment procedure is, yeah, mainly based on calculations on accuracy of the mounted parts, so the angles, especially of the polarizer, um, and also the alignment of the water wave plate. So if here anything would change over time, um, a new alignment is necessary. Um, we don't align these parts mechanically, um, but all software related, so I I showed this um, Jones matrix of this uh, wave plate and polarizer bundle. And here you can um, compensate for 
uh, a certain misalignment of these parts. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think we will um, conclude the, the Q&A session now. Again, there are some questions that we have not addressed, but um, we are happy to reach out to you if you leave us an email address or anything, and we will remain in the chat for a couple of more minutes to to get this information from you. And um, yeah, just just so you know, we won't forget you. If any other questions come up during the next couple of days or weeks, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, there is our tech support teams worldwide who are happy to assist, and you can find their email addresses on our web page under services and technical support. So just um, go there and, and find your local tech support office and reach out to them. The recording of today's webinar will be uploaded to thorlabs.com slash webinars and to YouTube in the next one or two days for you to rewatch or share. Um, there will be new webinars next year about other topics in the realm of photonics, so uh, stay tuned for more exciting webinars. Finally, I want to thank Manfred again for the talk and the answers to the questions and all of you for attending. Enjoy the rest of your days and uh, see you safe again in 2022. Bye bye.